by the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology and Metabolism Institute. This is an initiative by uh, EMI here at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio to uh, reach out to endocrinologists in the community with educational sessions by renowned speakers. We are delighted to have Dr. Vanita Arora today. Dr. Arora is the Director of Diabetes Clinical Research at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and is an associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Arora completed her training in internal medicine and in endocrinology at the University of California in San Diego. She has an interest and a published record in diabetes prevention and novel therapeutics in diabetes and age management. She also has a very strong interest in understanding therapeutic intervention in large multi-center clinical trials and has served as an investigator on the NIH-funded GREAT D2D and DPPOS study, as well as the national or international signatory principal investigator for multiple therapeutic clinical trials. Dr. Arora serves on the Professional Practice Committee of the American Diabetes Association. She is going to be talking about preventing type 2 diabetes back to the future. Dr. Arora, the floor is all yours. Thank you for coming and presenting to us today. Oh, my goodness. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation and the kind introduction. So let's begin. If I can click forward. Here we go. These are my disclosures. And... Moving forward. So why am I presenting on an area with very clearly established ex expertise and legacy? We've all heard of the Diabetes Prevention Program, you know, published now over 20 years ago. The uh, National Diabetes Prevention Program was formed and funded by the CDC in Cleveland. Yourself, you've got multiple certified diabetes prevention programs. You have multiple um, news articles. Everyone is everyone and their mother is an expert on diabetes prevention. So why in the world would I choose this topic? And the reason being is it's a few fold. So number one is as an investigator in the diabetes prevention program, um, one of the big take homes that I've come away with is that there are a lot of details that we are privy to or that you know we experience as an investigator with the participants on the shared journey throughout these large trials that doesn't necessarily get translated into the data graphs and doesn't necessarily get translated into the publicly available information. So I, I some a part of me feels that some of the detail has been lost in translation. And so I want to share a bit of, of the rationale and some of the details throughout to kind of put in perspective why we are where we are. Not only that, but if you look at our data, if you look at the statistics, the numbers are not going down. They're actually going up, up, up every year. If you look at the little icons in the upper right hand corner, you know, the, the density of the shading is just getting darker. The curves keep going up. Right now we have 37.3 million Americans and 96 million US adults on cue to, you know, potentially at risk of developing diabetes. It's a huge economic burden, a huge burden on uh, lost productivity. And, you know, now gaining increased awareness, we realize that there are other factors that come into play besides the clinical phenotype right in front of us, that there are a lot of social determinants of health, that even looking at where someone lives or what level of education that they received, you can have a half fold or a double fold, depending on how you look at it, just simply based on where you are, your family income, your education. So there are a lot of factors that we still are grappling with and don't have the best understanding of. And so when we have lost some messages in translation and now we have so many other factors, how do we actually approach this uh, epidemic? Not only that, but if you look at the complications that we have in terms of those complications that are driven by diabetes, we were all sitting pretty happy and pretty comfortably when we saw the data um, by Greg et al. in New England Journal of Medicine showing that, okay, in those with diabetes, the events per 10,000 adult uh, population in those diagnosed, diagnosed with diabetes was actually going down for complications. Well, this just reflects our improvements in secondary healthcare delivery, that once people have diabetes, we or if people are hospitalized, we know how to um, introduce and enforce secondary prevention. But if you look at the actual numbers, the actual number of cases, the actual number of cases of stroke, of amputation, of NCH renal disease, all of these numbers are going up. Why? Because the prevalence of diabetes itself is going up. 
And if you look at the follow up, so now data through 2015, we're starting to lose that. Uh, um, the downward slope that we're seeing, we're seeing an uptick in the complications. Not only that, but you're specifically seeing an uptick in the complications in those of the younger demographic. And this is the demographic where diabetes uh, uh, prevalence is increasing and the aggressive nature of it is increasing. And this is also the the diabetes phenotype that is more associated with obesity. So all of these go hand in hand. So we are actually on the losing end of the curve. We're not, we, we've lost our gains. Not only that, but if we look at statistics around the world, every year the American Heart Association updates its uh, statistical uh, uh, information on heart disease and stroke. If we look at the leading global cause of years of lo life lost due to premature mortality or lifespan, you know, in the 1990s, it used to be infections, diarrhea. Now it's ischemic heart disease. And when we look at the concept of health span or years of life lived with disability or injury, guess what's number one and number two? It's actually metabolic factors. It's no longer smoking. It's no longer iron deficiency. It's no longer other factors. It's high glucose and high BMI, both in the U.S. and around the world. So what I call this is we now live in a cardiometabolic world. And th this is our number one leading cause of life loss due to premature mortality, as well as uh, loss of quality of life. So to put the scope and potential impact of diabetes uh, prevention and delay into kind of current uh, importance, the only way we will impact the wide spectrum of complications in those with diabetes will ultimately be, be influenced by our efforts to prevent the progression to diabetes. Not only that, but this is a reminder that when we have the patient in front of us, there are many influences that contribute to the increased risk of diabetes. And so it's important that we ourselves retain our empathy and you know, don't cast judgment in terms of the risk factors that lead to type 2 diabetes. There are a lot of factors uh, related to location, located, related to income, related to social economic status. So it's important for us to appreciate the whole picture as we collectively address this challenging epidemic. Now, I want to take you back to where the diabetes prevention program began. It actually was based on a systematic approach to the literature to figure out who was at risk of progressing from impaired glucose tolerance to diabetes. So this was the paper that led to the ultimate design. The investigators did an analysis of six epidemiologic prospective studies, including the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, Rancho Bernardo, et cetera, et cetera, involving very different uh, patient populations. And what they found is, to, to the investigator's surprise, you know, we all thought that diabetes was um, just a disease of aging. But when they looked at age, again, this is in people who already had IGT and the risk of progressing to diabetes, that was not a consistent risk factor in terms of pro uh, predicting progression. But what was? It was body mass index, two variables, body mass index and glucose values. So as you can see, there's a continuous relationship between body mass index and risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes. And in terms of glucose values, very consistent across the board, kind of a threshold effect. So at a fasting glucose above 100, a much higher increase and in association with a risk of progression, as well as the two-hour post-challenge glucose uh, following a 75-gram glucose tolerance test. So kind of a kickoff effect. Now, what about other factors? Any differences in men and women? Nope. What about family history? Again, here we thought that type 2 diabetes was something uh, a risk that we just inherited from our parents, and there was not a consistent effect across the board. But what was seen was that if you looked at racial and ethnic minorities in the couple of studies that represented those populations, there was a higher risk of progression just by belonging to a minority uh, race or ethnicity. So this was where the criteria for the diabetes prevention program, oops, what did I do? Okay. Era. This is where the criteria came from. It was from the systematic approach and review of the literature of the EPI data. So hence the diabetes prevention program eligibility criteria. It wasn't uh, a criteria of aging. It was adults above the age of 25. 
and looking at those who are at high risk of progression. So the cream of the crop in terms of those who were most likely to progress to develop type 2 diabetes, those who had impaired glucose tolerance and a high fasting glucose and an elevated BMI adjusted for ethnic considerations. And there is a goal of enrolling at least 50% from high risk populations, recognizing that this was um, an unbalanced risk in those of ethnic minorities. But now fast forward to current day, and what do you see in the literature? You see um, publications such as this, which are really well done publications saying, you know, is is um, prediabetes an issue? Do we really have to think about it? So this is looking at data among older adults with prediabetes from the atherosclerosis risk and community study. And as you can see here, the prevalence of prediabetes by laboratory criteria, and I say that in quote be because it is a laboratory diagnosis, and yet that's not what the criteria were from the DPP, right? There were multiple criteria. So here we see in older adults without diabetes living in the community, the prevalence of prediabetes is quite high. So if you look at A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 or an elevated fasting, it's about 70% of the community. Now, is this population at risk of developing type 2 diabetes? Well, if you look at the uh, follow-up of five, on average, five years in this older adult population, what you see is that the risk of dying is greater than the risk of progressing to di type 2 diabetes. So, for example, in the A1C of 5.7 to 6.4% category, 19% died, 9% progressed, and 13% actually regressed. So this is where you get the counter argument of, you know, we really shouldn't be labeling people with prediabetes because that's just over medicalizing a condition and not everyone's going to progress. But if you look side by side, and I have for you here a comparison of the study on the left, again, the Eric study looking at the progression uh, from prediabetes to diabetes in older adults versus the original DPP on the right. This will tell you exactly that it's two very different populations. So for example, the average age um, in their study was 75. The average age in the DPP is your typical cardiometabolic mid-age adult, average age of 50. Well, what about body weight? So in the DPP, again, by virtue of the criteria, the um, individuals had to meet overweight or obese. And here you can see the mean BMI was 34. This is in the late 90s. So, you know, pretty hefty um, middle age cardiometabolic individuals. Whereas in the Eric study, for some reason, they didn't include the weight or the BMI in their baseline characteristics or even in the appendix. So I reached out to the senior author, um, Liz Selvin. And she referred me to other papers. And, you know, this is a typical older adult community dwelling population where the average uh, BMI was, you know, well below 25 and a majority of people were not overweight or obese. So when you see these debates come out in the literature, always put your clinical hat on and say, well, who, who is the patient in front of me? So the, the argument for saying that we need to still retain the diagnosis of prediabetes, and what I would say is that, you know, maybe there's there's tweaking that we can do in the in the labeling itself or in the terms itself, but is if you look at the risk of all of these outcomes, the risk of progressing to diabetes, the risk of coronary heart disease, the risk of stroke, the risk of death, there is clearly an association with your uh uh, glucose indicators or uh, glycated hemoglobin and these outcomes. And that risk extends well below the diagnosis uh, cutoff for type 2 diabetes. So it extends well below the A1C of 6.5. Not only that, but this, it, by diagnosing people and by looking at people who have prediabetes, we are then become more aware of their later cardiovascular risk and can be, be more in tune to those. And we have interventions that have been tried and true in terms of preventing the progression to type 2 diabetes. So this is the argument to say that we really still should be uh, looking at this and um, addressing this in our patients. Now, um, one of my roles that you heard in the introduction is I serve on the uh, American Diabetes Association Professional Practice Committee. So we update the standards of care every year, and it gets released and published every January online in December. So in a few weeks, 
uh, section three, uh, which deals with prevention, you'll see an update there as well. And I'm giving you the teaser here. And that is what we did as a committee is we said, okay, we know that not everyone is at high risk of progression, but can we look at the data that exists and says, and say, who is at particularly high risk? Who should we really be thinking about more intensive intervention? And guess what? It comes back to the same factors that I talked about in the beginning, way back prior to the design of the DPP, that it is really in those who are obese, so a BMI of uh, 35 or over um, as categorized in the DPP, and those with high glucose metrics, high fasting glucose, 110 to 125, high two hour post challenge at the upper end of the diagnostic category, and an elevated A1C, where you have a higher number of cases per year compared to even this high risk population. So if you look at the overall progression in the placebo arm, this gives you the natural uh, progression risk. So it was 11 cases per 100 person years in this already high risk group, right? IGT, elevated fasting and overweight or obese. But now you look at those who had a much higher uh, risk of progression and it's these factors. In addition, the history of gestational diabetes itself also increases significantly that risk above baseline. And as you can see, we have decent effects, actually really good effects with lifestyle inter intervention across the board and intermediary effects with uh, medication therapy. So it was these basic clinical indicators that really speak to us in terms of who might you be considering more intensive intervention, you know, who is standing on that cliff. Also, when we look at large um, epidemiologic studies, we see the same exact trends no matter which study we look at. So this is looking at over 4,000 Finnish men and women with a follow-up of 9.4 years. And what you see is um, in those who are obese, you have a nearly five times risk of progression to diabetes. In those who have elevated glucose values consistent with prediabetes, you see a six to seven fold increase and you put the two together and you have a 17 fold increase. So it's really those, these two clinical indicators. So my core message number two is that not all prediabetes is created equally. And if you keep that in mind, we can <laughs> settle all the debates that happen out there in the literature. So I think it just goes back to knowing your patient, knowing the type of patient that was studied in these, in these different studies and publications. But the idea for screening individuals is to identify those who are at high risk of progression to type 2 diabetes, but all, mainly for those who are at risk of the cardiovascular outcomes associated with type 2 diabetes, and not just cardiovascular, but also the microvascular. So in terms of the recommendations and the standards of care, it is uh, to recognize that prediabetes itself by the laboratory criteria is associ associated with a heightened cardiovascular risk. So therefore you screen for and treat um, modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Moving forward, so do we treat or not treat? So this is where I go back to my fellowship days. I was a fellow in 2001 where I was minding my own business in the fellow's office, as fellows often do, where lo and behold, I heard this big commotion and um, I step out into the hallway. And what do I see? I see all of our mentors. So Steve Edelman, Sundar Madalia, Bob Henry, um, my, my direct uh, mentor, everyone is out in the hallway cheering, celebrating, doing doing the some kind of you know celebratory dance. And we, all the uh, fellows, we all said, what's going on? What's going on? And they said, we've cured diabetes. We can prevent diabetes. So this is how big the results were of the DPP. And those of you in the audience that were there will remember just that sense of hope. And, um, you know, the DPP was actually terminated early based on the data safety monitoring report of showing such strong positive effect that at that point it was no longer ethical to keep people in a blinded study without sharing this information. So what was seen in this very high risk group of the eligibility that I described, um, compared to placebo, lifestyle intervention reduced the risk of progressing to diabetes by 58%, metformin by 31% on an average of 2.8 years. And this uh, primary outcome was uh, based on an annual oral glucose tolerance test or on a semi-annual fasting plasma glucose value. But I want to I want to um, take you back to what 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 the part that I do feel that is lost, and that is 
The DPP was an efficacy study. What do I mean by that? The efficacy looks at your performance of the intervention under ideal and very controlled circumstances. The intervention itself wasn't, hey, go exercise and lose some weight. It was the intervention was to support the participants to actually achieve and maintain the weight reduction of at least 7% through a healthy, low calorie, low fat diet, and to engage in moderate intensity for at least 150 minutes per week. Every participant had an individual lifestyle coach and access to support staff covering the entire gamut of education required dietitian, behavioral counselor, exercise specialists. It was a 16 session individualized one on one curriculum covering everything. And not only that, but this population was selected during the run in period. Every participant had to demonstrate that they could keep be compliant and keep a food diary, that they could be at least 80% compliant with the run-in medication to make sure that the best participants were chosen to be able to test the efficacy of the intervention. So this is a subtle nuance that we often forget. Not only that, but every site, every case manager had what we called the toolbox. So funds available to support participants in achieving the intervention itself. So what does that look like? Um, this is a publication from Health, Health Affairs that is a really nice read that says it all. But these are a few quotes that I, um, this one's from the article itself. The lifestyle participants went through what amounts to a kind of graduate level education in how to change their lives. And I saw this firsthand during our retention events during the dinner. Uh, one of the dinners was on the second floor and every participant, it was about 30 stairs to go up. Every participant, they ran up those stairs. The only person that took the elevator was the person in the wheelchair. So you could just see that every person um, really went through a transformation within the DPP journey. If you ask, if you meet anyone who is an original case manager in the DPP or one of the original PIs, ask them for their stories. So um, this is what one PI said. Vanita, we even went knocking on doors. We did whatever it took. So Mr. Smith, it's the weekend, you haven't gotten your 150 minutes of exercise, let's go for a walk. Um, Nike shoes, gym memberships, grocery vouchers, digital skills. We even bought one participant a treadmill. Now, again, this is the 1990s where, you know, Nike shoes and gym membership, those were really the luxury. Um, but they did whatever it took to make sure people achieved the intervention of losing the weight through a healthy uh, lifestyle means. And perhaps my favorite quote, in some respects, the coaches and others in the trial became the federally funded equivalent of nagging relatives determined to keep the participants adherent to the trial interventions and deeply motivated. Imagine if we all had that instead of our aunts and uncles and family members uh, nagging us to eat and finish our meals, but actually nagging us to do the opposite. So at the end of the DPP, um, everyone was unmasked and offered then a modified lifestyle change program in group format. So not the same individualized, but in a group format. And then the DPP continued in what was called the Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study. And 86% of those eligible continued. Those who were originally assigned to lifestyle continued with the modified lifestyle change program. Um, those who were originally on blinded metformin now continued on open label metformin, and those who were originally in placebo got the group format. Now, those who intensive lifestyle intervention had kind of a boost uh, lifestyle as well on top of the uh, modified format. And what was seen over 15 years, what you can appreciate here is that the greatest difference in incidence was really in the first few years. Uh, placebo at 11 cases per 100 person years, lifestyle cut more, more, more than half, and then metformin down to 7.8. But as you continue to follow the individuals, the slopes of the lines look much more similar. So the incidence over time is much more similar. In uh, post hoc analyses, what the theory that's been um, vetted is that this probably represents an exhaustion of the susceptibles. Now, re remember I said that these were the highest risk individuals. So likely there wasn't enough differentiation of risk to be able to see a difference over time. But there's probably other factors as well. Now, if you look over the full 15 years, you still see a benefit of both metformin and lifestyle intervention. Now, when we did our participant retention events, the message that we were to tell our participants was that Yay, approximately half of the individuals have not developed diabetes. But what I actually told our participants is, you know what? 
this is really humbling because despite all of our interventions, despite, you know, the cream of the crop type of participants and all the handholding, this tells you that this tells you the natural course that despite all that we have, even, you know, more than half still progress to diabetes. So developing diabetes itself is not the failure that that we should be taking away because um, even under the best circumstances, a majority still progress. So I, I want that's I want everyone to keep that in mind before we pass judgment on any of our uh, patients. Also, when we look at it, um, what was the key driver of diabetes prevention? If you look at in the lifestyle participants, again, small nugget that has gotten lost in the literature. Every kilogram of weight loss was associated with a 16% reduction in risk of diabetes. So it really did amount to weight loss itself. Not only that, but if you look at the metformin group, we looked at a bunch of different factors, metabolic factors, weight, et cetera, uh, physical activity. And the percent of the group effect was largely explained by weight loss itself. Now, if you look at the weight loss trends over time, uh, the weight loss with metformin was about two to three kilograms, but that was sustained over time. So remember I said about one kilogram translating to about 16% uh, reduction. So that's about what you see over the 15 years. Now, what do we see in the intensive lifestyle? We see the very humbling reality that it is very hard for people to maintain weight loss, even under the best circumstances. So it's we're able to get weight loss off, but to maintain it, it's difficult. And this is again in a very controlled setting. Also what was seen, if you look at the uh, long-term outcomes, the composite of the microvascular outcomes, so nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, this was significantly less, 28% less in those who did not progress to diabetes. But what you appreciate here is that there's an inflection point. The inflection point at about an average A1C of 6.2% is where you start seeing the takeoff of the complications. And the association, with risk is associated to the mean A1C, so average A1C over time, as well as duration of diabetes. So it's the glucose measures itself, as well as duration of exposure that translates to risk of complication. And the other key point is that risk is seen regardless or agnostic of the treatment group. So regardless of the intervention, those associations remain true. What was also really neat, this is um, analyses done by led by uh, Lee Perot and colleagues is that if anyone achieved one time point of normal glucose regulation, there was a 56% lower risk of diabetes during follow-up. So if they achieved at least one point where their fasting glucose was normal or the oral glucose tolerance was normal, that translated into a lower risk in the long term, probably reflecting other efforts at, at bay. And again, this is also agnostic of treatment group. Also, for anyone who achieved the one time of normal glucose regulation ever during the DPP, they had a lower aggregate uh, risk of microvascular disease, and specifically of nephropathy and retinopathy individually. And this association was primarily due to glucose itself. So it was likely due to uh, lower glucose exposure over time. Now, I want to fast forward now to present day, uh, 2022. And this is uh, I've been, it's been a privilege to be part of the American Diabetes Association Professional Practice Committee, where we review the evidence every year. I've been on it for three years, and it leads to very lively debate, some of which you hear on these large podiums and see in the literature, and where we come up with what we think is sound advice to help um, the community at large. And what we did is we added this a section within the prevention chapter. Now, the title of my grand rounds is preventing type 2 diabetes, but you, what you'll see here is that what we've stated is when you look at the patient-centered care goals, it really amounts to three areas in your adults with overweight obesity at high risk of type 2 diabetes. Notice we didn't call it in people with prediabetes because as I shared with you, there's just so many nuances there and not all prediabetes is created equally. So you really need to think about it. This in your overweight obese individuals at high risk, Number one, looking at weight loss or prevention of weight gain. Number two, minimizing the progression of hyperglycemia. So it isn't about reaching that diagnosis of diabetes and, and saying we're done, um, you've succeeded or you failed. It's minimizing the progression itself and then uh, having attention to cardiovascular risk, that that is the perspective. So in, uh, you know, 
we all talk about preventing type 2 diabetes, but our care goals are really uh, more broad than that. Now, I've called this back to the future. Hopefully everyone has seen the ultimate, you know, trilogy where what you realize is sometimes you need to go to the past to explain where we are in the present in order to affect what we do in the future. So I am going to go to the way past. This is a, what I think is a seminal study done by my own mentor, uh, Bob Henry. And this was in 1986 where he asked the single key question is, what are the quantitative effects of weight loss on mechanisms responsible for hyperglycemia? Is there an association? And again, we've been kind of talking about weight loss, but it's never really made it to the front until now, I would say. So you looked at eight individuals. Now, this is this is pretty bold. So these were obese, otherwise healthy individuals with type 2 diabetes. So again, looking at mechanisms related to hyperglycemia. Admitted them to the inpatient metabolic unit, did all uh, types of studies, the OGTT, the meal tolerance test, clamp studies to look at liver sensitivity and whole body sensitivity, open biopsies to look at uh, transport of glucose across the adipocyte, um, and supported weight loss using a very low calorie diet of 330 to 600 calories per day, then repeated um, all the studies at the end following a weight maintenance period. Why following a weight maintenance period? To look at the effect of weight loss, not of the hypocaloric state, but of weight loss itself. And if you look at the basic metabolic parameters, what we see is that these the average age was 54. A majority of them were already on treatment that was completely withdrawn. And a decent amount of weight loss was achieved, 16 kilograms, with marked improvement off all therapy despite having diabetes for about seven years, marked improvement in all metabolic parameters, improvement in the BMI, normalization of fasting glucose down to from 277 to 123, A1C improving from 11.9 down to 7.5, and improvements in all lipid parameters as well as adipocyte cell volume and cell surface area. But when you look at the uh, mechanisms of effect, you see uh, improvement in the oral glucose tolerance test and mixed meal tolerance test, but not completely back to normal as represented by these dots um, without any change in the insulin levels. So suggesting that there's reduction in glycemia without change in insulin levels translating to enhanced beta cell sensitivity to insulinogenic stimuli. Now, what about the CLAMP studies? The 120 milliunits per meter squared per minute, that tells you hepatic glucose sensitivity, and then the higher uh, insulin dose tells you your whole body insulin sensitivity. And as you can see, a significant improvement in both, but not completely to the normal range. But <clears throat> when he looked at hepatic glucose output, there was a, a significant improvement back to the normal range and suppression of hepatic glucose output. Um, with maximal insulin stimulation. So an improvement, a normalization of the glucose put out by the liver that was tightly correlated with the fasting plasma glucose, suggesting that the normalization of hepatic glucose output was predominantly responsible for the lowering of fasting plasma glucose in these individuals. Now, what about um, effects on insulin binding to the adipocyte receptors and glucose transport? There was no effect on the binding to the receptors, but increased basal and maximal glucose transport, suggesting, again, a post-receptor insulin defect um, that was improved with weight loss. So putting it all together, what we see in the spectrum of type 2 diabetes, which I would argue that pre-diabetes is really just a continuation of that, that in individuals with type 2 diabetes and obesity, we have significant improvement in glucose homeostasis, homeostasis reducing hepatic glucose output, translating to a reduction in lower um, in fasting glucose, improved postprandial and post-challenge glucose excursions, significant amelioration of hepatic and whole body insulin resistance, and improvement in post-receptor insulin action, and enhanced sensitivity of the beta cells to insulinogenic stimuli. Putting it all together, providing insights into both the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes and the response to weight loss. Two years later, Ralph de Franza coined the term, you know, the triumvirate as the proximate causes of hyperglycemia, which again, prediabetes is just that earlier model of. So now 
Fast forward back to the future again. The direct study was just published a few years ago. This was a primary care led intervention looking at individuals with type 2 diabetes um, within the diagnosed within the past six years, age 20 to 65, so clearly in that metabolic range of age, where um, they were withdrawn from their type 2 diabetes therapy and uh, randomized to a weight management program of total diet replacement of about 800 to 850 kilocalories per day with stepped food reintroduction with a co-primary outcome of who could achieve at least a weight loss of 15 kilograms or more and a remission of diabetes off all medications from baseline to 12 months. And as you can see here is um, within the intervention group, 24% were able to achieve at least the 15 kilogram of weight loss, and 46% were able to achieve remission. So achievable and doable. Really challenging the notion that we've all thought about that type 2 diabetes are all doomed in terms of it's naturally progressive. But what you see here is that there's a tight association with the magnitude of weight loss and the magnitude of um, ab ability to achieve remission, with 86% of those in who lost 15 kilograms or more achieving complete remission of type 2 diabetes. Now, fast forward to two years uh, later, and what you see on the right is that the numbers are a little bit less, but still persistent. So in those who are able to maintain at least 10 kilograms of weight loss at two years, there's a 64% remission. And on the left-hand side is data uh, published uh, in follow-up looking at MR uh, imaging of the pancreas. And as you can appreciate from the pictures above, going from baseline to 24 months and comparing to the non-diabetic comparator group, you actually see an increase in pancreatic volume and normalization of the irregular borders surrounding uh, the pancreas and an increase in maximal insulin secretion. So really the concept that you can potentially reverse the pathology that we've seen in type 2 diabetes with weight loss. Now, weight loss has been reproduced in a number of studies, not just in lifestyle intervention uh, trials, but also in studies looking at anti-obesity medications. And the same tenet holds true that when you lose weight, you reduce the progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. Now that the FDA hasn't approved any agent for diabetes prevention is because of their unease at using medications that know, are known to lower glucose to say that they then lower glucose. But again, I would kind of reframe and take you back to the big picture of what our what are our patient-centered goals. When we look at the effect of weight loss on obesity-associated complications, it goes well beyond just metabolic effects. We see effects on metabolic parameters, um, dyslipidemia, hypertension, hyperglycemia in that zero to 10% weight loss. Again, in the DPP was about 7%. But as you start seeing higher magnitude of weight loss, at least in secondary analyses from the studies, you see improvements in some of the more um, definitive markers of disease. So improvements in osteoarthritis, GERD, sleep apnea, NASH, stress incontinence, cardiovascular disease in secondary analyses, and improvements in um, indices uh, in heart failure and mortality as well as in remission. So it's really trans, it's really an association of magnitude of weight loss. Uh, my colleague uh, Ildiko Lingve published this in The Lancet and, and her colleagues saying, and it's really kind of made us rethink this through on the guidelines uh, and consensus committee level that, you know, to date, when we looked at glucose lowering in type 2 diabetes or even in prevention, we've always focused on this downstream approach of glucose. But, you know, maybe we need to look at both upstream intervention as well as downstream intervention. And if you look at the natural course to type 2 diabetes, at every stage, we have something that we can prevent in our metabolic patients. So prevention of comorbidities, prevention of prediabetes, prevention or resolution of uh, prediabetes, resolution of diabetes, and prevention ultimately of the complications associated with dysglycemia. Now, if we look now at the newer therapeutics that are being looked at for weight loss, as well as for improvements in type 2 diabetes, here we are seeing kind of record-breaking changes that we haven't seen before, where we are seeing a very high degree of weight loss. So this is uh, looking at once-weekly semaglutide in adults with overweight or obesity in the step one trial. As you can see here, about a 15% mean weight loss uh, with semaglutide compared to placebo. 
and a high degree achieving um, a high percentage of weight loss. So 50% achieving 15% or more. Now, what does that translate for the population with prediabetes? Um, this is a pre-specified analysis. So in persons who had prediabetes at the beginning, looking at the end of study, at the end of week 68, 84% who were assigned to semaglutide had normal glycemia compared to 47% with placebo. Similarly for terzepatide, another a GLP-1 um, and GIP dual agonist, you can see that at the end of the trial period, over 95% assigned to trisepatide had achieved normal glycemia. And again, high degrees of weight loss that we really hadn't seen with metabolic therapies prior. So, uh, so, uh, so. Oh, I'll keep going. 20% um, uh, in the highest dose of trisepatide. And again, high degrees achieving high magnitudes of weight loss of the 15% or more. Now, what about other therapies that don't address weight loss? Here we have data from the IRIS study looking at pioglitazone, an insulin sensitizer, doesn't cause weight loss. We all know that. And in fact, it actually caused weight gain. But it addresses the underlying physiology of type 2 diabetes in terms of supporting um, and enhancing insulin sensitivity. And as you can see here, uh, by five years for the primary outcome, which included fatal or non-fatal stroke or fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction, you see a nearly 25% reduction in the outcome uh, with uh, pioglitazone compared to placebo. Now, the IRIS study, the criteria included people without diabetes who had elevated HOMA IR, so an index of insulin resistance. Um, and so on the right is a postdoc analysis really pulling out people who met the diagnostic criteria of prediabetes. And as you can see, very consistent effect across the board in terms of reducing stroke or MI and coronary syndrome, as well as um, preventing the progression of diabetes. So whether you're looking at glucose indicators or weight indicators, both have effect. I share this because I think this is this is enticing. This is a secondary analysis from the DAPA heart failure study, looking at an SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, DAPA glyphosin, and the incidence of diabetes. The incidence was significantly lower, 32% uh, lower. But it, interestingly, if you look, there was not a meaningful effect on A1C, and we know that the SGLT2 inhibitors have a more modest effect on glucose. But in those who didn't progress to type 2 diabetes, a marked reduction in the cardiovascular outcomes. So could it be that just targeting some of the underlying pathophysiology early on translates to better effect um, independent of its glucose effect? And I think that's what the SGLT2 inhibitors have taught us. Now, what I shared with you is data from the DPP that despite all best efforts, a majority still progress to type 2 diabetes. So what should we be doing once they progress? Do, is it important at that point? But for this, I share with you the diabetes and aging study showing that even within that first year of diagnosis, compared to having an A1C of less than 6.5%, in those who had an A1C of greater than 6.5%, there is an increased risk of microvascular events, macrovascular events, and mortality. And similar analyses and data when they looked all the way up to seven years, showing that that mean glucose exposure, the lower, the better. Now I want to fast forward to um, the ADA EASD uh, consensus that was just published and presented um, in September of this year. I'm shifting gears from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes because, again, as I shared with you, it's part of the same spectrum. Now, what we did here is we reviewed the 8,000 publications in the literature that had been published since the last time the consensus mate met back in 2019. And we put together, you know, the rationale, the therapeutic options, personalizing approach strategies for implementation. What I'll share with you is a, the key update. So one is, and why I'm sharing this here is because it's the same exact goals, whether you think of someone in the pre-diabetes stage or in the diabetes stage. The goals of care are the same, to prevent complications, to optimize quality of life, and we have to look at the whole picture. So we have to look at all the different factors that can influence the quality of care for a patient. What's the underlying physiology? What are the social determinants of health? What are the psychosocial factors? What is the shared decision-making? Because none of the decisions that we make 
are, you know, five-day antibiotic decisions. These are lifelong decisions. It is the chronic care model. And when we look at the medical factors to address, it really is the same. So we want to make sure that we help uh, our patients achieve and maintain glycemic control, evaluate their weight goals, and help achieve and maintain weight goals, look at the full cardiovascular risk uh, factor picture and support that. And in those where there are demonstrated agents that have organ protective effects, this here is for type 2 diabetes, uh, to consider those agents. Now, what we've seen in the literature is some of the heart failure studies, renal outcome studies, you actually even don't need a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes to have organ protective effects. So what we did is, if you all recall, the previous guidelines for type 2 diabetes had six different lanes, six different pathways. And what we said is, you know what, there really are two key decisions for patients along the diabetes spectrum, and that is, uh, are they, do they fit the risk profile where they would benefit from organ protective therapy? That's the pathway on the left. And in, in all patients, what is their glycemic goal? How can we help them achieve their goals? And notice there's some key differences. In previous uh, algorithms, there's is all drug-based, so sequential therapy of adding one on top of the other. Here we said, let's keep it at the patient, keep it at the goal, and recognize that we have a lot of different tools to help support that goal. For the first time ever, weight management has been elevated to a co-primary, knowing how intricately related weight is on glucose. So weight itself, uh, weight management itself can translate to diabetes outcomes and recognizing that we have a number of different tools to address weight that we can consider for the individual. And if they're not that goal, keep in mind that we need to address social determinants of health. We have important DSMES services to support self-efficacy, and we are now living in the age of technology. Another subtle nuance is you'll notice that there's not arrows going down from any of these. And that's because, again, this is a holistic picture where it's not going down one pathway or the other, but really considering the whole, that you have to consider both um, uh, organ protection as well as glycemic goals achieved through both glucose and weight management for the whole picture. So moving forward, back to the future. We're living in an exciting time where we have a lot of epi data, a lot of therapeutic data, and I think a real broad understanding of how we might be able to address this epidemic at an individual and a population level. So this is a really exciting time to be in research, to explore new implementation ideas, to really translate what we've demonstrated in these large seminal studies to the future. But in order to do that, we need to kind of divorce ourselves from this traditional medical model. What have we done in the patient care setting? Time and time again, we translate it to, okay, um, energy expenditure, energy balance translates to food and beverage intake in and physical activity out. But you know what? There's actually a socio-ecological model. There are lots of um, influences and forces that funnel down to that final end result. So whether it's your cultural celebrations, what your workplace setup looks like, that just um, where your environment is, whether you live, you know, within walking distance of a fast food restaurant or not, all of these translate to uh, differences in risk. So my last couple slides, this is just a picture show. If we look at our data and the world we live in over the last uh, couple of decades, there are these are some examples of where things have changed. You know, from the 1950s to the 1990s, we've supersized everything. We have food deserts where it's really hard to get accessible uh, fruits and vegetables that are healthy, where it's easier to, you know, get the unhealthier choices. We have um, had significant urbanization of our neighborhoods, leading to more of a commuter society rather than a walking society. Our greatest export around the world probably has not been our greatest export, uh, where we see the westernization of many of the um, uh, other countries. Uh, previously, we used to get a lot of physical activity uh, through household chores, whether it was, you know, washing clothes or vacuuming. Now we've got a lot of automation in our households. This, I didn't have to go far. This was at my local Patel Brothers where um, I said, whoa, what is this? 
uh, you know, growing up in my visits to India, the definition of an overweight child, the term used was healthy. Like, you know, they say, oh, you don't look healthy enough. Oh, now you look healthy based on, again, history of those who survived being more the overweight. We live in an age of technology where it's easy to just get drawn in and sucked into our sedentary uh, world. And, you know, slides like this don't come up overnight. It takes, if they don't happen while running on the beach, they happen while we sit. And so what happens when mom sits? The family thinks that that's the playtime instead of throwing the, the Frisbee around. But we try, you know, we try to educate ourselves. We uh, try to make a difference. This is my uh, treadmill at my my office, uh, my, my walking treadmill. So we use the knowledge that we have to see if we can make a difference. So this, um, level of awareness that there are a lot of different factors that contribute to determinants of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes led to the first ever uh, scientific statement by the ADA, where we put it all together that we have to think beyond just the medical model, even though we are all such a fan of the medical data that, you know, the DPP provided. And what we stated is that, you know, to date, the medical model has focused on the um, on the individual and it has provided limited benefit in curbing these epidemics. We really need to think of a population approach and a public health approach if we really wanna make a difference to prevent disease, to um, have further impact and progress against these epidemics. So with that, I wanna leave time for exchange, reactions, questions, and um, just appreciate the participants who have committed their lives to helping understand this entire course. Uh, the DPP now is, uh, um, you know, has its next phase of funding looking at aging related to Alzheimer's. So the the it is the study that will continue to give. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and say thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ara. That was a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed listening to you and looking at all the data that we have. So I have a question. You showed us that the very low calorie diets in the eight participants from your mentor showed that they could get off the diabetes medications, great A1C control, drop uh, weight quite a bit. One of the things that I've seen in my practice is all these people lose weight and then the weight comes back. We see that switch almost everywhere. Now, we also know from obesity studies is as these people lose weight, and this is my concern even with Tizepidide and semaglutide and the kind of immense weight loss we have seen in these studies is these patients are also losing muscle. They are not just using fat. And when the weight comes back, I worry that this all comes back as fat. So are there any studies that look at what happens to their diabetes when the weight comes back? Are they showing diabetes, which is much worse than what where they were before they did the weight loss intervention? I think... Those you, you nailed it on the dot um, at multiple points. So um, glucose and weight go hand in hand. And what we've seen, there's very limited study, but there um, the semaglutide studies showed a follow up once um, the drug was withdrawn. And what do you see is very immediately you see a regain of the body weight. So within even within that first month. So I think that's something that we need to be well aware of that this is a chronic condition that we're treating. Now, if, again, if you look at the average data across the studies, um, they'll say that you don't see a significant loss in the lean body mass. But again, we have to think about the individual patient. And so what I do is I make sure that once people are starting to have uh, meaningful weight loss, I make sure that they're on some resistance exercise program because you need to be looking at this, um, you know, for the long term. And then the other thing is realize that we don't have to push maximal doses on on all patients, that it really should be tailored and individualized. But uh, you you are correct. These are going to be challenges. No matter how, how you lose the weight, our body is programmed in this current env environment to, and not just our body, our cells themselves are programmed to, you know, try to get that energy back. We are all using tirzepidide off-label and seeing immense amounts of weight loss that is happening. But I worry what will happen when that, you know, that wonderful coupon finishes and then we are all stuck with patients who are now going to gain all this weight back because of all that appetite that's going to come back once the medication and, and what's mind-boggling for me is that these are individuals who have experienced the mechanistic effect. They know what it's like to have satiety. So it isn't 
this has told me that it isn't a matter of willpower. This truly is showing that there is an underlying biology that we don't have as, as good control over, that the moment you stop a medication, everything comes back. Even though people experience this very, you know, I feel full, I feel full, they, they, they don't feel, they, they finally experience satiety. That's true. Legitimate concerns and food for, for new studies to the young people in the audience. You're getting the research ideas right here. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Feynman says, thank you for the great presentation. And he would like to point out that Bob Henry graduated from University of Manitoba, where Dr. Feynman is from as well. So we'll start with, did COVID-19 contribute to the current blip in diabetes complications? Say the last part again. Uh, did COVID-19 contribute to the current blip uh, in diabetes complications? Oh, no. Uh, great question. I think we have yet to see what the true impact of COVID will be. So the, the complications, the blip that I showed you, that was till 2015. So we, we don't have the data in follow-up, but guaranteed we're going to see um, a, a not so nice effect, especially in our younger generation, I, I, I think. I think that's where um, if we had to invest in terms of where we should put our efforts, it's those in that 18 to 45 year age group where I, I think the effects of COVID, the current society that we live in, and the great aggressive nature of diabetes itself at a young age uh, will make a difference. I think we, what we saw was the division of the population in two kinds during the pandemic. One that became much healthier because they had more time to hike and prep, and the other that started working from home and had great access to the pantry. So it, I think, remains to be seen, as you said, what happened to this population moving forward. I think the next question is very interesting, and I would like to see this. What Can we use the findings in the West to the epidemic of diabetes in the Middle East Gulf states? And I think this applies to South or Southeast Asia as well to some extent. What do you think about that? So it's challenging because you have cultural beliefs that you have to challenge. And uh, you know, to address cultural beliefs, you really need to make it sexy <laughs> to, 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 you know, eat healthy and to prevent diabetes. There are just so many. Uh, and I think, you know, we're slowly getting there. But um, the one thing I, I will point out, again, the lifestyle intervention, who had the greatest success in the DPP? It was the older individuals. And some of the theories is that they actually had the time. They had the time to exercise. They had the time to make a difference. And our current society, we're just so limited on time. So I think there's a lot we need to think about to modernize prevention in current day and climate anywhere around the world. It's interesting you were you were showing us that box with the picture of that little girl who's clearly overweight but is termed healthy. Coming from a Indian background, I can completely empathize that my own kids are too skinny according to their grandmother. So uh, I can completely understand that. Um, any thoughts on the apparent U-shaped mortality curve with the hemoglobin A1C? Yes. So again, it goes back to your patient. Why are they why are they there? So the U the U shape. So if people are too low body weight, you have to think about why why they're there. So are they there due to other co comorbidity? Um, and again, I think it goes back to your patient where you have a sense of when they're starting to enter the more frail weight loss area. Um, and and I think the key is to look at where they are at baseline, try to achieve that five to ten percent, and depending on where they are, stage of disease, stage of complications, realize that you could potentially target the underlying disease with greater magnitude. I, I think that's that's where I leave it at: is the epi curves take uh, the whole population; they don't look at the individual. Agree with that. I think there was a very wise person who's probably on the call today, Dr. Lakada, who during my fellowship told me. You have to look at your person. You have, don't have to just look at the research. So very wise words. <laughs> um, uh, the last one is, can you comment on the control of the other cardiovascular risks of smoking, blood pressure, and lipids? Fundamental, foundational, and... Um, so smoking cessation, I think we've made huge progress there, and I think it's because of, the, again, this public health model that took effect, where it was multiple sectors of society, where suddenly it's not cool to smoke in the workplace, not cool to smoke in air airports. So it, 
it is a multifold effect. However, you have to be aware that when people sm stop smoking, for example, there is a potential risk of increasing body weight. So that is a vulnerable time period where you have to think about intensifying your preventive efforts. Um, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, I think all of these, there's a reason why they cluster together. They are all parts of the tips of the iceberg and that when we address the whole picture, we are addressing whole health. So as you saw in the full circle approach in our updated consensus, there's a dedicated section of equal importance, no beginning, no end for cardiovascular risk reduction. Thank you. Um, we are at eight o'clock, so uh, some of our clinicians have to be in clinics. Thank you so much, Dr. Ora. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you also for agreeing to present right after the Thanksgiving weekend. We appreciate it. <laughs> no, uh, just to remind us. <laughs> thank you, everyone uh, who's on the meeting today, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks to you.